Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Getting ready to study the Bible with you, I hope. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we begin our study in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. So get your Bible and get ready to study the Bible verse by verse, which I think is the only, it's not the only way to go, but I think it is the best way to go because we are studying it just the way God gave it, line upon line, precept upon precept, and verse by verse. From Genesis through Revelation, Scripture verse by verse has been teaching the Bible. I have been teaching the Bible now well over 30 years. Three complete series of going through the entire Bible. On my fourth right now, by the grace of Almighty God, and I am so thankful to be able to do this. He has blessed me by allowing me to do this. I appreciate it so much. And you can study the entire Bible online. Those first three series are all archived for you at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Father, we ask that today you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name, amen. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. In other words, he's talking about supplying the needs of other Christians. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia, and that's referring to Corinth, was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked many, has excited others to give. You know, living for Jesus is contagious. Being on fire for Jesus is contagious. Giving is contagious. Being excited about helping to get out the Word of God is contagious. And God wants to use you as a spark that ignites that fire. Don't wait for the other person to do it. Why not you? When a Christian gets on fire for Christ, that fire will spread to other Christians. Again, devotion to Jesus is contagious. Why not be known as the one, be known by God, not necessarily by others, that doesn't matter. Why not be known by God as the one that he could count on to start a fire for Jesus? Verse 3. Yet have I sent the brethren... lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, that we, say not you, should be ashamed in this confident boasting. If a Christian doesn't back their words about Christ with acts of devotion to Christ, then their words are empty. They're meaningless. And it's really a cause for shame. Because you can't be trusted. You cannot be counted on. Your word means nothing. If great swelling words of devotion to Jesus Christ are not followed up with actions that correspond to those words, and he's your Savior, and he's Almighty God, then what good is your word concerning other things? Verse 5. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you, 
and make up beforehand your bounty. It's talking about their offering that they pledged. Whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Meaning this, it is good to plan ahead the best that we can so that there is less pressure when the actual time arrives. God is in favor of planning. Now, it doesn't always work out that way. There are spur-of-the-moment things that are just come right into our life, and we don't have any time to plan. We never even saw them coming. God will give you the grace to handle those if you're walking with Jesus. But as a rule, God is in favor of planning. I mean, he planned the redemption of man long before he even created the world. And I know some people think that that if you plan something, like if you plan a worship service or you plan something, that the, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always has to be spontaneous, go without planning, just do whatever pops into your head at the second, at that second. That's not true. I'm not saying that never happens. But God works through planning, too. He is a God of order. The Bible says, let everything be done in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, let everything be done decently and in order. So don't exclude planning as if God can't put thoughts in your mind about how to prepare for something. Use that common sense that God has given you. Verse 6, but this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So if you give just a little bit to the Lord, then he's going to bless you just a little bit. If we're stingy when it comes to giving and supporting ministries that get out the word of God, then he's not going to bless us much. If, if we are generous, then God will be generous to us. You know, to a certain extent, we control the type of life that we have. Do you want an abundant life? Do you want a life that's full of blessing, spiritual, especially, but other ways as well? Then live a life like that. Give a life like that as well to God be generous to God and we will and he will be generous to us because the Bible says that we reap what we sow and it says what it says right here but this I say he which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully every man according to as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. As he purposes in his heart, so let him give. In other words, don't let someone talk you into giving. Don't let someone pressure you into giving. Don't let someone give you false promises of health and wealth. If you give, don't give out of compulsion. As you purpose in your heart, give. The more you love Jesus, the closer you are to Jesus, the more you're going to love and appreciate the Word of God. And you're going to love and appreciate those who proclaim it, who teach it clearly as they should. And the closer you are to Jesus, well, the outworking of that close walk with Jesus is going to be to support men who proclaim the Word of God as they should. And that's what he's talking about. And it shouldn't be coerced. It should not be... Um, forced in any way or manipulated in any way. It should come from your heart. That's what God wants. He wants it to come from your heart. He wants you to love Jesus and let your giving be an outgrowth of that love for him. Voluntarily. 
That's what he's looking for. You know, if you're a parent, you may not necessarily enjoy getting up in the middle of the night and taking care of a a sick child, but you do it willingly. You wouldn't have it any other way. You wouldn't want anybody else to do it. You want to do it yourself because you love that child. I mean, how many times has your little boy or little girl fallen down and skinned their knees? They're running. You know, it it seems like that's uh, that's something that happens to every child. You know, they run down the sidewalk or they run somewhere and they fall and they skin their knees and they start crying because they hurt themselves. And you wouldn't have it any other way. You go there and you try to make them feel better because you love them. That's what he's talking about here. Give to Jesus for the same reason. You wouldn't have it any other way. You don't want to be excluded from giving to help get out his word because you love Jesus. And, and so, again, let's read 6 one more time, and then we'll go into verse 7. And this I say, he which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, if it's not willing, willing, willful giving, willingly giving, it's not really Christian giving. For God loves a cheerful giver. That pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? God loves a cheerful giver. God wants you to give to his work because you care about him. And you genuinely want to please him. You know, we all do so many things that displease the Lord. When we commit sins, when we do things that we should not do, when we fail to do things that we should do, that's disappointing to God. It's nice to know what things please God. And if you love Jesus and you want to please God, then give to him willingly. Give to his work willingly. That's important to him. He doesn't need your money, but he does use your money to help get out his word. He does use it. And he has chosen to work that way. And It's not a burden to give to the Lord's work. It is a privilege to give to the Lord's work. You don't have to give to help get out the Word of God, to please Jesus. You get to give to do that. So God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God gives us what we need to do what he wants us to do. If God, if if we have a willingness to give and we give, then God will definitely make it up to you somehow. He'll bless you in some way. I've heard it said, you can't outgive God, and you can't. The Bible says, how's this? Give, and it should be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall man give to you. From God, of course. Verse 9. As it is written... He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. A Christian who gives has a heart for God. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. Again, I said this a couple of broadcasts ago. You want to know what's important to you? Look at your checkbook. What do you spend your money on? 
I'm not talking about the necessities of life. Beyond the necessities of life, what do you spend your money on? That'll tell you what your heart is, where your heart is, and what's important to you. And a person who gives to God has a heart for God and also gives evidence that they are right with God through Jesus Christ by faith. A giver is righteous before God because, again, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And so he says in verse 9, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. What does it say? His righteousness remains forever. You're not saved by giving, but giving to the Lord's work, giving to help get out the word of God is a sign that you are saved. It's just, again, a natural outcome of that. It's a, it's a barometer, just like the old checkbook that I was talking about. It's a barometer of where you are at spiritually and how Jesus is important, how, how much Jesus is important to you. Verse 10. Now he who ministers seed to the sower, and that's speaking of the Lord God Almighty, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. In other words, what he is saying here is that you cannot outgive God. It is impossible to outgive God. In fact, if God never gives you a, one more thing, which he will, of course, but if he wouldn't, hypothetically, if God never gave you one more thing, you still couldn't outgive him because he's given his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. He's given his son. His son willingly became a man and died on the cross to pay for your sins. You're not going to hell. That's an amazing gift. You're not going to burn in hell forever. You're not going to be in torment forever because Jesus paid for your sins. You're going to be raised from the dead because Jesus paid for your sins. You're going to have a brand new physical body, the one that you're in right now, only raised and improved. You're going to live on a brand new earth. No corruption, no sin. Wonderful, wonderful existence. You can outgive that? See, this is what this is about. When you understand what Jesus has done for you, if that doesn't stir your heart to give to him out of love, then you got to ask yourself the question, do you really believe it? Have you really received Christ? Because that's just strange. That doesn't even make sense. You can't outgive God. He's already outgiven you. You could give everything that you have, which all belongs to him anyway, by the way. And you still went out give God. But he doesn't just give us what he has already given us through Christ. He promises to give more. In one form or another, God will repay anything that you give. And the amazing thing about it is, like I said, anything that we have is already his to begin with. So he gives us everything that we have. He owns us. He owns everything that we have. And he asks us to give back to him what belongs to him in the first place. And then he blesses us for doing it. For doing it. How can you not love a God like that, right? How can you not want to serve a God who is so wonderful? How can you not want to give to a God who is so loving and so generous to us? Verse 11, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. God can trust us with material things when he knows that we won't put those things before him. Verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints 
And that's specifically speaking of the, the poor saints in Jerusalem to where this offering was going to go that Paul is talking about. For the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. That's something that maybe you haven't thought about. God's people, though, do understand that good things come from God. I hope you understand that, that every good thing that you have, every buck that's in your wallet, every dollar that's in your bank account, everything else that you have is good is a gift from God. I hope you thank him for everything. But, but God's people, if they're, if they're in the know, if they know the word of God, they understand that all good things come from God. And that's why when Christians are good to each other, watch this, they will be busy thanking God for the good that they are experiencing. Whenever someone gives me an offering, I immediately thank God for that offering. Immediately. Because I know all good things come from Him. Now, I also thank God and ask God to bless those who give. Oh, I absolutely I do. I tell God how much I appreciate them. And I ask God to bless them for their love for Him and their love for His Word and their kindness to me. I don't take any of that granted for granted ever. But I always start by thanking God because it's all His. Verse 13. Well, by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Again, be nice to other Christians. And at least if those Christians are walking with the Lord, it's going to result in thank yous to God. And isn't that something that you want to happen? Doesn't that stir you? Don't you believe that God deserves thanks and he's not thanked enough? You could thank him from now throughout all of eternity and it wouldn't be enough. But every time you do something nice, every time you give to the Lord's work, well, if the guy have, has a half a spiritual brain that you're giving to, he's going to thank God for that. But every time you give to a Christian who is walking with the Lord, who loves Jesus, they're going to thank God. And then God will receive thanksgiving. And that should make us happy when God is thanked. So be nice to other Christians. That's going to result in thank yous to God. In other words, if you want to do something nice for Almighty God, then do something nice for a child of God who truly loves Jesus. And you know that act of kindness or generosity from you to them, it's going to flow right up to God immediately in the form of thanksgiving if they truly love Jesus. And if they don't, then they got a problem. Verse 14. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, and you can bet this too, you can bet that when you are nice to another Christian, if they are spirit-filled, if they're walking in the Spirit, if they love Jesus, when you are nice to another Christian, they're going to pray for you. You better believe they will. Like I said, when I receive an offering from someone, first, first thing I do, immediately, I thank God for it. First words out of my mouth, thank you, Jesus, for supplying my needs, for blessing me. And then that's immediately followed by praying for the person who gave. And if I know some of their personal needs, I'm absolutely praying right away for that. If I don't necessarily know what any of their personal needs are, I just pray a lot of general prayers for them. Bless them financially, bless them physically, bless them spiritually, bless them in every way. Whatever way I can think of, I immediately pray for them. And God is honored by that too. You see how devotion to Jesus spreads? And giving to Jesus spreads? 
if you are giving to people who love Jesus. Now, some people are just in it for the money. Some preachers are in it for the money. Some pe preachers are in it for whatever, fame, just for the opportunity to speak in front of people. That's true. There are some like that. But boy, any Christian man who is teaching the Word of God because he loves Jesus will respond that way. They'll be so grateful. Verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. God gives many gifts. The Bible says every good and perfect thing that we have comes down from the Father of lights. So God gives us many good things, but his unspeakable gift, his indescribable gift, is the gift of himself. It doesn't get any better than that. If you are a father or a mother and you love your child, can you just imagine allowing your son or your daughter to die for someone else? To make that sacrifice? And many of you have. I know that. And you're so proud of them for their heroic actions. And you should be. But that's one thing. But can you imagine, as a parent, willingly, knowingly, giving your son or daughter that you love knowingly asking them to die for someone else? Not having it be oh, just one of those things that happen, but knowingly do it? And how about this one? giving your son or daughter, giving their life for one of their enemies, somebody who has done bad things to them. That's what God has done because we've all sinned against him. We've all done abominable things to him, and yet he gave his son. And I used to think that Jesus got the short end of that deal. You know, it's like the father, you know, I used to always hear, you know, God the Father gave his son to die on the cross. I used to think, man, what about the son? He got the short end of that stick, didn't he? No, then you start reading the Bible and you realize that Jesus could have called it off any time. Yes, the Father gave his son, but Jesus gave himself willingly. So God gives us many gifts, but his indescribable gift is the gift of himself. God Almighty becoming a man and then bearing reproach and torture and crucifixion from sinful man in order to pay for man's sin. That's beyond description. I've just described it, but, but that's beyond our ability to grasp that kind of love. That's his greatest gift. You can't, see, that's why you can't outgive God. And when you understand that, you'll want to give to him. When you see what his gift of himself accomplished for you, you'll want to give to him. You'll love him. And it will come from your heart, which is what he wants. I'm out of time, but you can continue studying the Word of God right now at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go to thebibleversebyverse.com, click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please remember, we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. Never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. Never, never have been. Never. This has been a faith ministry for 30 years. And you can give in a secure method as the Lord may lead by clicking the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com or you can write scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074, scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, 
Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. So long.